So is it necessary to uh, suffer a great deal on this path, on the razor's edge path that we're recommending to people to direct awakening? God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it isn't. But, but there is a uh, faction within the Redemptive community which believes that, in fact, you must go through a so-called dark night of the soul, deep suffering period, or you haven't had a valid experience. You must suffer. And to me, that that uh, too much like the Christian ethos. And many people who say this are now Buddhists, but they were ex-Christian. They're ex-Christians, and so that is part of the Christian ethos. So you will suffer. You must suffer to purify yourself. Well, I mean, I can see part of it because I know that a lot of times the thing that I learned the most from, you know, are little cosmic teachings that get my attention precisely because there's a, a modicum or great deal sometimes of suffering mm -hmm. associated with them. But I think probably the slippery slope there is to identify the suffering itself with the teaching, mm -hmm. as opposed to the reason why I'm being taught something right now is because I have not learned how to let go of my idea of self and that's making me suffer. And then I perform a kind of weird jujitsu maneuver on it and say, wow, I'm really grateful for that suffering. You know, and that's actually a good move. I say, oh, I'm grateful for the suffering. And in gr being grateful for the suffering, the fixed idea of self can dissolve mm -hmm. because the experience of gratitude is the experience of you know, that dissolution of the ordinary self. Mm -hmm. But then we get back into our ordinary self conversation and we say, wow, that was some good suffering. Mm -hmm. That really felt, I, you know, where would I be without my suffering? Thank you so much for my suffering. So it's an understandable, logical uh, um, conundrum, but how, how do we get out of it then if we've made that sort of conflation, which is how I think of it. We, we've stuck these two things together. Well, the conflation, too, also happens in art. I mean, many artists have told me, well, if you understand, I have to have my suffering to create my art. All good artists do. I said, no, they don't. I mean, Cezanne didn't suffer, Matisse didn't suffer, uh, Van Gogh did, but, yeah. but, but not all artists suffered. The Zen artists didn't suffer. I mean, that isn't, I mean, people, if you say they conflate the suffering with the good art, in fact, they may have been completely unrelated. They may have been past suffering, but to say you have to keep your suffering now to create good music or good art or good sculpture uh, just isn't correct. Well, and it might just be you know, a so-called, you know, state-dependent technique. It may indeed be a, way, a, a method that they used, mm -hmm. you know, to get themselves into a state of selflessness, right? Mm -hmm. One of your only real responses that you can have to serious pain, for example, is to letting go of the fixed view of self. Otherwise, you'll suffer more. Mm -hmm. um, so you can imagine that somebody found that technique to get into the non-dual state in order to be generative mm -hmm. and creative. But again, that doesn't mean you have to use suffering to get there. It just means that's how you discovered it. Right. Doesn't make it causative. Doesn't make it causative at all. And it probably means you're kind of addicted to it. In other words, like you just keep going to that. You're saying, oh, so if I, you know, if I basically jab myself cosmically, mm -hmm. then I'll be creative. Well, no, that probably means you're getting tired in your uh, routine and mm -hmm. you're probably the generativity is probably falling off the creativity is probably falling off but what would be some techniques for uh, being able to sort of ex to experience and observe that we're doing that conflating the suffering because we can well, see well, logically that that's the case but yeah what well, I mean it gets back to getting rid of the eye I mean the, the one of the solutions for dark dark night of the soul which is this, this uh, phenomenal within the Christian history uh, is look for who is it having this thing. I mean, do some self-inquiry. I mean, one problem with a lot of the, in my humble opinion, Buddhist teachings is that they don't have self-inquiry. I mean, you can do mindfulness, some very elaborate and sophisticated and very powerful techniques for mindfulness, but there's no disabusing mechanism to undermine the eye. So you come to these exceptional states, but you come there without done anything of doing anything about your eye. And so you've got this eye that may very subtly be getting huge, 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 more huge. 
and there's no challenge to it. There's no vehicle, no pedagogical approach that you can take to disabuse this I that now finds itself in some strange terrain. And so the I gets really panicked by this whole thing. My God, what's happening to me? All these experiences, I'm not parties, I didn't make these things, this is awful. Stop, stop, stop. And unless you've wound down that I, it's going to be very powerful. It's going to fight back very hard at this uh, unexplained and uh, huge experience that's going on right now that it doesn't like because it sees itself losing ground and yet it's hanging on with all its might. And it's much more powerful now. Right, so... Uh... The very same thing that leads us to sort of conflate the suffering means we conflate our self, our I, with these experiences. I am a really experienced meditator. I am having these experiences. So that seems great when the experiences are good, mm -hmm. uh, but when the experiences aren't so good, mm -hmm. then to be an I is to be a locus of suffering. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, I think it comes from St. John of the Cross, actually. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how accurate even that representation of the Christian tradition uh, is in the, in the mystical tradition, because it, it feels like, um, you know, even in the, uh, you know, St. John of the Cross tradition, that there would be that tradition of looking for the selflessness behind the one who is having the experience mm -hmm. uh, of pain. And that it's only a kind of very... Uh, superficial reading of the some later parts of uh, different Gospels that would lead you to equate Christ's suffering with, you know, his Christic quality. In fact, Christ's uh, teachings don't really, never, if, if, to my mind, you know, people can post comments, but I'm trying to come up with a place where he recommends suffering. No, but we do have the, <laughs> we do have the Stations of the Cross, we do have the cross, but, you know, it's the only religion that actually has a, an instrument of pain, suffering, as its iconic figure. You know, all the, nobody else picks on that. And so, not the mystics, because yeah. mystic, but the non-mystical non Christians, that's their, where they live and breathe and have their religion, is looking at the cross. The irony, of course, is that a lot, you know, a good deal of that comes from the sort of history of things like the Passion Plays, Mm -hmm. in Europe, or the modern-day equivalent, Mel Gibson's film, mm -hmm. uh, The Passion, yeah. which, in their emphasis on this torture and suffering, are really attempts to provide a narrative, a story, that blames someone yeah. for Jesus' death, right. rather than seeing the teachings that Jesus, is, Jesus was bringing and offering, which were commensurate with many traditions, yeah. including the Buddhist tradition. So it may be that what we're seeing is a repetition of that same gesture. It's like, yes, yes, I know, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself, love God with all of your heart. You know, who among you is going to cast the first stone? Like, none of those things have anything to do with suffering. Right. But for some reason, our narrative mind recoils from that mm -hmm. because it involves a kind of dissolution of itself. It means a letting go of. It means a turning the other cheek. Not to suffer, but to let go. Mm -hmm. And we focus instead on, yeah, but what did they do to him, right? Well, that was Gibson's <laughs> film. Gibson's yeah. film, I think the book was, it was way over the top on this, look how bad this suffering really is. And I think that's much more the mainstream Christian view than the mystical view. Yeah. And where it is, you know, it is all about horrible suffering. Like you say, let's blame somebody for this because this horrible thing happened. But that he went through a lot of suffering. And I, I never found something very interesting. I mean, but is it an interesting? No, it's, it's, it's almost the very definition of not that's interesting. Why, that's why I have it called, yeah, that's why you get rid of it. But the, the Buddhists, you know, at their base, the whole theme of Buddhism, all the Four Noble Truths, is you've got you know, suffering, you've got attachments, you've got the attachment, you get rid of your suffering. But nobody's advertising they want to have suffering, and yet I've heard Buddhist teachers at recent conferences stand up and say, I need my suffering, I want my suffering. So I can be authentic, I can be human, I can be compassionate. And I haven't found suffering to be necessary, any more suffering, to be compassionate. You can be, do use your past stories of your experiences of suffering to be compassionate. Well, or just being present for another person yeah. manifests that compassion, that, 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 that passion that transits right. Right. between apparently separate beings. Um, Something that's coming to mind is, is that what it feels like is that, 
you know, it, it's, it's almost like people want to go to the suffering to solve. You know, they feel like they're on their path and maybe they feel like they're, they're lost. And they say, okay, well, I, always, I can always go to old reliable suffering and that'll clarify me. Because, you know, as we've discussed, sometimes, you know, if you have some pain, it keeps you, as I like to call it, in the pocket, mm -hmm. right? You know, that you have to stay focused on the source, on non-dual awareness, otherwise you'll suffer more, mm -hmm. right? So there, there's that conflation there. But suppose we just retuned it slightly and said, instead of saying suffering is necessary to my compassion or suffering is necessary to my path or my suffering makes me human. Suppose we said, we said no, your karma yoga makes you human. Your karma yoga gives you compassion. In other words, why would it be more important to suffer than it would be to do something for somebody else? Mm -hmm. Now granted, that has its hazards as well, because we risk, to go back to the Christian tradition, puffing ourselves up because we're so charitable, yeah. we're so good at doing for other people. And we suffer. But it at least gives a displacement on the idea that the suffering is the cause of our insight. Right. It says, no, what the cause of the insight is, is the temporary or permanent erosion of the boundary between self and cosmos, self and other. Mm -hmm. And one of the best ways I know of doing that is just be involved in activities for, with, together with other people. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like a self when I'm involved in those activities with other people. And earlier in my... Uh, itinerary, that would be something that I automatically almost went to. I would, you know, something really bad would come up. And I don't think I had access to self-inquiry yet. And one of the things that I almost unconsciously figured out was like, do something kind mm -hmm. for no good reason, without any object, without thinking there are going to be any fruits of that uh, generosity or charity. And it immediately cuts it. But I don't hear that no, but, that, but that does very unusual perspective, though. I mean, there's, there isn't very much helping goes on in the world today that isn't, you know, let's make a deal. It isn't, yeah. isn't reciprocal altruism. It really yeah. is getting into, I'll do this for you, but I want something back in return, ultimately. Yeah. Maybe even soon. So, not many people actually come to karma yoga, I mean, yeah. doing your work in the world without expecting any return on it. Right. That they want something back. And so they're playing a different game, what you're talking about. So compassion is really, I'm compassionate for you, but then I really expect something back out of it. It's karma points at the very least, but probably something out of you, some real deference yeah. or something. Yeah. Well, what's, but, but what's interesting, then, is we have this past, we let, like, just, you know, imagine, as I once was, like, I'm stuck on suffering. Mm -hmm. And then, instead of being stuck on suffering, I practice, you know, giving of self. And in practicing giving of self, I'm no longer stuck on suffering. But now, I'm s I could be stuck on giving of self. But if I practice the renunciation that is spoken of in the Bhagavad Gita about renouncing fruits mm -hmm. of charity, it's only a slight little tweak. It's saying, you're just doing it to do it. You know, My example, I might have even talked about in another video. I remember, I remember I used to, when my son was a baby, you know, just to try to keep order in the house, like one of my practices was really sweeping. Mm -hmm. And I would sweep, you know, and I would kind of dissolve myself in the, in the sweeping. And then, you know, every now and then, you know, say my, my wife would come into the room or she would come home or something like this, and she wouldn't notice that I had swept. And I'd say, oh, you know, where, you know, I can't, where, why, where, why did I bother to, right, do, right, exactly. to, to do it? Which is that kind of, you know, yeah. quid pro, pro quo charity right. that you're talking about yeah. there. But I don't even remember what it was, but it was just like, well, but I'm just sweeping. I just enjoy the sweeping. I'm not sweeping for any particular reason. I mean, maybe to clean the floor, but also just sweeping. Right. And you, it, I think if you do it enough, if you observe in your activity of that karma yoga enough, not that that was really karma yoga, that was just household right. uh, activity, then you can kind of feel the rising of that expectation for some sort of fruits. Mm -hmm. And in feeling that arising, then you can practice, that, that, that can bring you into the self-inquiry.